Hello everyone, welcome to this new presentation. So today I would like to talk about population dynamics and about a particular model that describes population extinction. And it's actually related to some of the older simulations I put on this channel. Now, population dynamics is quite an important subject in mathematics. There are many different models for that. Perhaps the oldest known model is the model involving Fibonacci numbers. So I'm pretty sure all of you know about the, the sequence of numbers. So you start with one and one, and then each new number in the sequence is the sum of the previous two numbers. So the sequence is one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, and so on. And this model was actually introduced from Fibonacci or Leonardo of Pisa around 1200 to describe the proliferation of a population of rabbits. So he considered that you start with a couple of rabbits and after a given time, maybe a year, maybe less, they uh, have one couple of offspring. And then at each time step, the offspring becomes adult and every adult couple has again a couple of offspring. And so if you count the number of couples at time n, after n iterations, it will be given by the nth Fibonacci number. Now another model that was introduced by Malthus at the end of the 18th century is the model of exponential growth. So Malthus was concerned already at that time about the human population on Earth increasing faster and faster and the fact that at some point it would cause problems due to limited resources. Now there's uh, another model which is a modification of the, the Malthus model introduced by Verholst a bit later that introduces uh, another term in the equation that models the fact that resources are limited and therefore the population will actually stabilize. An interesting fact is that the logistic model was first formulated in continuous time, but if you take the discrete time version, you get the so-called logistic map that has interesting properties related to period doubling and chaos. And another example of model for population uh, evolution, which is quite well known, is the so-called lotka volterra model, and that is a model describing the evolution of a system of predators and prey, such as, for example, uh, lynx and hare in, uh, in Canada. And what is interesting about this model is that it is able to reproduce a cyclic evolution of populations and time, which has been observed. Now, all these models have either to do with population growth or maybe with a cyclic evolution. But today I want to talk about a model uh, for population extinction. So this model was uh, proposed by Sir Francis Galton in an article in 1873 in a newspaper called The Educational Times. And uh, he proposed a question that was answered shortly afterwards by Reverend Henry William, and together they wrote an article on the solution of the model. It turns out that actually the French mathematician bien -Aimé had already studied this model before, but Galton and Watson apparently were not aware of that. So uh, Sir Francis Galton was concerned with uh, the disappearance, the extinction of certain aristocratic family names in England at his time. So at that time, family names were only transmitted through male descendants. And whenever an aristocratic family would have no male descendants, no sons, or their sons would ha not have any children, the family name would disappear. And it is actually believed that uh, this mechanism explains uh, the distribution of family names in certain countries. For instance, in China, nowadays, uh, it's 
appears that there are about 300 surnames, existing surnames, but in the past there used to be many more, more like 12,000 family names. Now, apart from historians, maybe today not so many people are interested in the extinction of family names, but many people are concerned about the extinction of endangered species, and this Bjarne Golden Watson model is a simple model that is able to describe this phenomenon to some extent. So, to explain the model, let us look at an example of genealogical tree. So, here I've only uh, shown the female people from a certain tree. So uh, we have here the ancestor called Anne. So Anne had two daughters, Barbara and Beatrice. Barbara didn't have any daughters, but Beatrice had three of them, Karina, Cecilia and Cindy, two of which again had two daughters. Now the Golden Watson model assumes that there's a certain probability distribution of offspring for each individual which is always the same, but all uh, these uh, different numbers of offspring are independent of each other. So to give a concrete example, let us assume that each individual in our tree has no child with probability 1 over 8, one child with probability 3 over 8, two children with probability also 3 over 8, and 3 children with probability 1 over 8. Now the numbers here I have chosen are not important, it's just to have an example. The only thing that matters is that the sum of all these probabilities should be 1. And as I said, I assume that the number of children of different individuals are independent. So. Here are two examples of uh, genealogical trees generated with this, argument, uh, with this algorithm. So at the left, I've shown it in a linear fashion with time going from top to bottom. And at the right, I've shown a similar tree, but now using a polar representation because there's more room and space uh, in, that, in that way. And let's look at a, a simulation uh, of how such a tree is created. I originally wrote this uh, simulation code because I, I wanted to represent some trees in, a, in, so in lecture notes, and it's actually not so easy to draw a nice tree with uh, siblings that are not too close to each other. So I wrote an algorithm that uh, has some repulsion between siblings. So there's an, attractic, uh, an attracting force between children and their parents, and there's a repulsive force between brothers and sisters in such a way the tree will occupy uh, most of the space available, and it gives a nicer tree. So I probably at some point should make a new versions and higher resolution of these old simulations. Now, here's another simulation uh, which now uses polar coordinates, so just because there's a little more space. And again, so you see what happens is that each of these individuals has a certain number of offspring. It varies here between 0 and uh, 3, I believe. And you have this tree appearing. And the question is, what is the probability that at some point there are no individuals left? That after some generation, all uh, offspring uh, have disappeared. Now, it turns out that this can be computed quite exactly in, a, in the following way. So, let me write Q1 for the probability that there are no children at generation 1. 
So I'm assuming here that there's only one ancestor because actually if there are several ancestors, one can deduce the extinction probability thanks to independence from the case with only one ancestor. So the probability of having no children at generation one, well, this is of course one over eight because that is exactly the probability that my ancestor has no children at all. Now, how about the probability Q2 of having no children at generation two? Well, this we can now compute by looking at different cases. So the first case is, of course, that there's no child at generation one. And of course, there can't be any children at generation two. And we've already seen that the probability of this happening is one over eight. But another possibility is that there is one child at generation one, but this child has no children. So what's the probability of this happening? Well, the probability of having one child we said was three over eight. And then by independence, I have to multiply this by Q1, which is the probability <coughs> that this child has no children at all. And let me not replace Q1 by its value one over eight. You will see why. Another possibility is that the ancestor has two children <coughs> and none of these has any children. So the probability of that is as follows. So three over eight is the probability that there are two children. And now each of these two children has to have no children at all. So for each uh, children, the probability is Q1. Both are independent, so both don't have any children with probability Q1 squared. And the last possibility is that the ancestor has three children. That gives a probability one over eight. And none of these has any children. That gives me a Q1 to the three. So the conclusion at this step is that Q2, the probability that there are no children at generation two, is given by this expression. So one over eight plus three over eight Q1 plus three over eight Q1 squared plus one over eight Q1 to the power three. But now you see it is quite easy to generalize this because I can express the probability qn plus 1, that there are no children at generation n plus 1, in a very similar way in terms of qn, which is the probability uh, that there is uh, no one at generation n. And by exactly the same argument, what I find is that qn plus 1 is a certain function of qn given by a similar expression as here. So 1 over 8 plus 3 over 8q plus 3 over 8q squared plus 1 over 8q to the 3. So just by iterating this map, q is mapped to f of q, I can find all the probabilities of extinction after n steps. And a nice way of solving this iteration problem is the following graphical way. So here I have written my induction relation again with my function f of q. And here I have plotted q on the x-axis, f of q on the y-axis, so that is the red curve here. And the black line here is the diagonal, so where qn plus 1 is equal to qn. And we've already seen that we start with q1, which is 1 over 8, so 0 0.125, which is somewhere here. Now I can find q2 just by looking at the vertical over q1 and where it crosses the red curve. That gives me q2. 
Now to find f of q2, I need to have q2 on the abscissa. And this I can do by plotting a horizontal line here until I hit the diagonal, and then a vertical line, and that will give me q3. And I just keep doing this, and you see on this picture that actually I will have this kind of infinite staircase, and the staircase will approach a value q star, and this q star is a solution of the equation f of q star equals q star. Now this is a polynomial equation that we can actually solve, because so I have to find a zero of f of q minus q. So that gives me a certain polynomial of degree 3. But observe that f of 1, that is 1 over 8 plus 3 over 8 plus 3 over 8 plus 1 over 8, that is equal to 1. So I know that my polynomial is divisible by q minus 1. And if I do this Euclidean division of f of q minus q by q minus 1, what I get is 1 over 8 times a polynomial of degree 2. And for this polynomial of degree 2, I can find its, uh, its roots, its zeros. So there are two zeros, but only one of them is positive, as it should be, and that is square root of 5 minus 2, which is about 0 0.236. So with this graphical construction, I have shown that my sequence of qn is an increasing sequence that will converge to this value q star, which is about 0 0.236. Now, this was a particular example, but you can easily now see what happens in general. So let me assume that I'm given certain probabilities, so p0 of having no children at all, p1 of having one child, p2 of having two children, up to pk of having k children, where k is some positive integer. And by exactly the same argument as before, I know that q1, so the probability that there's no one at generation 1, is equal to p0. And then I know that every qn plus 1 will be given by f of qn, where f is now the following polynomial. So it's a polynomial of degree k and q, and the coefficients are p0, p1, up to pk. And again, one remark is that if I compute f for q equals 1, I get the sum of all these probabilities, which has to be 1. So f of 1 will always be equal to 1. Now, if you think about uh, this graphical construction we've done before, okay, you need just some assumptions on p0 and p1 to be non-zero to avoid uh, singular cases. But then uh, you realize that there are only two possibilities. So the first possibility is that this curve, so the red curve is again the graph of q maps to f of q. So you see, if p1 and p2 are positive, you actually have an increasing uh, and uh, convex function. So this f can, uh, so it will start at, uh, at p0, and then it may cross the diagonal the first time at the point q star, and then it goes below the diagonal, and then it crosses again at 1. And actually, it can cross only twice, because f is convex if uh, p2 is positive. Now, if this happens, uh, then I know that q star is my extinction probability, because if I iterate here my, my map, I will converge to this q star here. And you see that this happens if the slope of my red curve here 
that q equals 1 is strictly larger than 1. Now the other thing that can happen is that actually my curve here uh, crosses the diagonal the first time at q equals 1 and in that case when I iterate my map I will converge to 1. So in this case my extinction probability is actually equal to 1 so with probability 1 almost surely my population will finally become extinct. So the only difference qualitative difference between these two cases is the slope of f at 1. And now we can compute the slope. So if you know about derivatives, you can compute it uh, immediately. But in case you don't know about derivatives, uh, there's a simple argument. So let us say that q is 1 plus y. And so I replace this q by 1 plus y, this q squared by 1 plus y squared, and so on. And now I expand all these powers, but I retain only the terms that do not depend on y and those which are proportional to y. So the coefficient independent of y is just the sum of probabilities, p0 plus p1 up to pk, which has value 1. And the term which is proportional to y has the following expression, p1 coming from here, plus 2p2 coming from expanding the square here, plus 3p3, plus on and so on, up to kpk. And then we have, in general, higher order terms, which we, are, we don't care about, because you see what happens is that f of 1 plus y is this constant 1 plus some number m times y plus something of order y squared but which has no influence on the slope. So the slope at 1, that is this sum p1 plus 2p2 etc plus k p k, p k and it's also the derivative of f at 1 and this is nothing but the average number of children, or what we call in probability the expected number of children. So what we have shown with this relatively simple argument is the following theorem. So if the average number of children is uh, strictly larger than 1, then the population goes extinct with a certain probability q star that is strictly smaller than 1 and it is the solution of f of q star equals q star uh, which is strictly between 0 and 1. And on the other hand, if the average number of children is less or equal 1, then the population will go extinct with probability 1. So in a sense, it is quite intuitive. So the average number of children has to be larger than one for the population to have a chance of survival. What is remarkable, however, is that the answer depends only on this average number of children. Now, this is the simplest and best known property of this Galton Watson model that one can show, but mathematicians have looked at many other properties that are more difficult to analyze. So one thing you can do, for instance, is say that you only look, so you take an average number of children strictly larger than one, which is called the supercritical case, and then you only look at instances where uh, there is survival. So once we say that we condition on the population surviving and then we want to have properties of the trees. So what do the trees look like? Uh, what can we say on the number of individuals, on uh, different properties, geometric properties of these trees? And there are also many 
more uh, we find models that are based on this Gordon Watson model called branching processes. So here are two simple examples. Well, they are simple to formulate, but not so easy to study, uh, in which we have introduced a space. So you can use this kind of model, for instance, to describe a population that is introduced in a habitat on an island, for instance, and multiplies. And so here we have a one-dimensional space. So we have individuals that perform random walks so they go either left or right with probability one half. And at certain times they uh, give birth to, to other individuals. So we have this genealogical tree with a certain number, random number of offspring. And if the Galton Watson process is supercritical, if the average number of offspring is larger than one, then we have proliferation, but we also have a certain distribution in space. So the question is, how does this distribution in space behave? And there's a modification of this model, which is called branching random walk with selection. And in that case, we say that the X coordinate here is some, kind, some type of fitness. So it doesn't have to be the distribution in physical space, it could also be the distribution in genetic space. So we could say that the x-axis is some genetic trait, maybe how fast the individuals run or how good they are at gathering food or something like that. And now to, to model selection, we only keep a certain number, maybe the 10 fittest individuals. And that will introduce a drift in my population. And again, one can study how uh, fast this drift is, uh, try to compute some uh, properties like the average drift and so on. So that's it for today's talk. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.